it's a wonderful time once again, and uh, uh, I welcome us to this uh, uh, evening session, this uh, uh, nightly presentation where we are dealing with the series on the tabernacles. And the Lord has been uh, gracious enough to accord us his presence, to be able to take care of uh, the instruments and even the finances needed for the uh, streaming of the same. And so I'd like to welcome us, those viewing from different parts of the world and those listening that uh, may the good Lord bless us as we continue going through this series of the tabernacles that is uh, the sanctuary on earth and the sanctuary in heaven, looking at the type and the anti-type of uh, the same and um, having a practical experience of what uh, the compacted prophecy is all about. Uh, we understand that um, the sanctuary is uh, a compacted prophecy uh, of the plan of redemption. And so I'd like us to pray and then we can be able to enter into the presentation fully. Shall we be able to pray? Dear Father in heaven, it is uh, a privilege to be in your presence and to just uh, feel the presence of the angels and the heavenly host. And Jesus Christ amidst us to guide us in every act of righteousness. I pray that you may anoint my lips and uh, anoint the ears of uh, my brothers and sisters that we may get uh, to learn of the wondrous things in thy word. And so, Lord, we have prayed in faith and we know that you have heard us because you are not a God who is so far away from us. So minister to us. This is my request in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the subject uh, of the sanctuary, as I said, it is a subject that uh, all of us need to study and restudy because every day there is uh, fresh information and uh, the old light, the old light shining in uh, a very splendid way more than it has ever shined as we draw close to the end of everything, we see the Lord shining forth in his word. Uh, today, as uh, are on this presentation, as I said, we are dealing with, uh, this is part seven, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this is the Ark of the Covenant. You can see it. And uh, sometimes there is uh, a different view of the same. There is uh, various artists coming up with uh, something. But uh, I believe uh, we can understand it as it is shown. And this is um, from another angle when uh, the priests or the high priest is in the holy place uh, trying to go and approach it in the day of atonement. You, you can see how beautiful it is, uh, how the sanctuary was beautiful in the inside. And I was speaking in the last presentation, presentation number six, that really our hearts have to shine with the brightness of heaven and uh, when the inside is as bright as you can see on the screen, when the light of the sanctuary, the candlestick, which is pure gold, shines forth and gives the light, we have various colors in the sanctuary, which almost gives you a rainbow, a symbol of peace, a symbol of mediation, a symbol of covenant. And that light penetrates through this veil and then uh, 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 coupled with the Shekinah glory that came to rest on the sanctuary, the people of God in the camps that surrounded uh, the sanctuary knew that uh, the Lord had accepted the sacrifice. It was a magnificent piece of work, and we are told that Christ himself was the architecture of the 
uh, sanctuary itself and the plan. And so we can be sure that from Christ, we have beautiful things and not only beautiful things, that, but things that uh, uh, can uh, bring us joy and salvation. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant, you can get the information from Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 to 22, and chapter 37, verses 1 to 9. This was a box constructed of acacia wood covered with gold. Inside it was kept the two tables of stone upon which the law of God, that is the Ten Commandments, was written. Later, it uh, also contained Aaron's rod that budded and a pot of manna. The lid of the ark was called the mercy seat. You can check that, Exodus 25, verse 17. And we are told in the book of Hebrews, let us come boldly before the throne that we may obtain mercy in the time of need. That should be in Hebrews chapter 4, I presume, verse 15. And above it was, let me just make sure that is the verse, because sometimes when we have the Bible, we don't need to guess about it. The book of Hebrews, chapter 4. It is verse 16, but verse 15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was one, but was in all pointed, points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And that was um, the meaning of uh, the mercy seat. And above it was the glory of the Lord was present between two covering cherubims or angels on either end of the ark. If you missed the presentation on the efficacy, go check it because I deal with the efficacy that deals uh, of the angels, the uh, unfallen worlds, and even humanity. The mercy seat or lead represented Jesus Christ, the mediator of humanity between the law of God that requires the death of the sinner and a merciful God. The high priest was the only person allowed to enter the most holy place where the ark was kept. And that was only on one day of the year. That is the day of atonement known today as Yom Kippur. The ark of the testimony from Solomon's temple was secreted away before the Babylonian capture of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar and was never present in Herod's temple. The armies of Titus found the Holy of Holies quite empty in 70 AD. The ark remains unlocated today, and uh, that is some of the information we want to deal with. Uh, although there are numerous speculations about it, its whereabouts. In Revelation, which was written about 95 AD, the ark is seen in chapter 11, verse 19. It is interesting to note that John is seeing the Ark of God in the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly sanctuary, which was utterly destroyed in 70 AD by the Roma armies of Rome. And so when you go to Hebrews, uh, we read this, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden center and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we can now speak particularly. And uh, you understand from uh, the description in, uh, from the description in Exodus chapter 25, and Hebrews chapter 9, there is no book of Moses that was besides the ark uh, in the most holy place. And so this is the representation of uh, the ark according to the book of Hebrew. It had uh, the two cherubims, covering cherubims. We had the mercy seat. Then inside it, we had the pot of manna, and we had the tables of the testimony, and then Aaron's rod that budded. Missing there is uh, the book of the law, the extra 
uh, um, um, laws and the statutes written by Moses was put beside the ark in the most holy place. Now, what does the what is the meaning and uh, what is the significance of the ark of the covenant? We want to look at the ark of the covenant and the spirit of prophecy. And uh, the tables of stone presented three times. We are told. And so here I have like uh, 26 statements on the ark. And uh, I pray that, Lord, that as we go through this, that uh, we shall have an understanding of the ark of the covenant or the ark of the testimony. In uh, Prophets and Kings, page uh, 453, paragraph 2, the earthly tables of stone, their fate and presentation to the world prior to the close of probation. Among the Russia still in Jerusalem, to whom had been made plain the divine purpose, were some who determined to place beyond the reach of ruthless hands the sacred ark containing the tables of stone on which had been traced the precepts of the Decalogue. This they did. With mourning and sadness, they secreted the ark in a cave where it was to be hidden from the people of Israel and Judah because of their sins and was to be no more restored to them. That sacred ark is yet hidden. It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. Now, I want to make a point that um, a sinful person cannot come into conduct with the ark of the testimony uh, or the ark of the covenant because therein it contained the law of God, which only can slay and cannot save. It is only by the mercies and the grace of God that we are shielded, shielded from the condemnation of the law because we have accepted Christ in our hearts and he is the fulfillment of the law. Then we can be able to approach the throne of grace with boldness, knowing that um, the law does, not lo does no longer condemn us. In the book of Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, we read, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And then in the second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17, we read that, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The law in the ark of uh, the testimony is a transcript of the character of God. His throne has its foundation on the principle of love. And so you cannot approach the God who dwells in an approachable light while you are willfully sinning against his law. Now Christ has become a law unto us that we may attain the righteousness of the law. No human being can be able to attain that righteousness of the law unless he is hid in Christ. And so this piece of work was uh, of the most importance uh, it was of the most uh, importance. Only in Christ can we get the redemption. Only in Christ can we be able to approach this throne uh, of grace. Only in Christ can we be able to approach uh, this throne of grace. Continued on. We read, because of Israel's transgression of the commandments of God and their wicked acts, God suffered them to go into captivity to humble and punish them. Before the temple was destroyed, God made known to a few of these faithful servants the fate of the temple, which was the pride of Israel and which they regarded with adultery. While they were sinning against God, he also revealed to them the captivity of Israel. These righteous men, just before the destruction of the temple, removed the ark removed the sacred ark containing the tables of stone and with mourning and sadness secreted it in a cave where it was to be hid from the people of Israel because of their sins and was to be no more restored to them. The sacred ark is yet hid. It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. This is uh, 
Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, A, page 114, paragraph 4. You can find it in uh, Spiritual Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 414, paragraph 3. So we find that uh, because of Israel's transgression of the commandments of God and their wicked acts, God suffered them to go into captivity to humble and punish them. Before the temple was destroyed, God meant for a few faithful servants the fate of the temple, which was the pride of Israel, and which they regarded with adultery. That is what we have read. And uh, he allowed the ark to be hidden. And uh, in, um, um, in KC, that is, uh, this is Christ's collection. Uh, we read this in Christ's collection. This is um, what um, we read. At that time, at that time, the Lord said unto me, here the heal thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up into me into the mound and make thee an ark of wood. And I'll write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shitty wood and hewed two table stone, two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in mine hand. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you out of the mount, out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I had made. And there they be as the Lord's commanded me. Yes, there they were to be hidden and preserved to justify the obedience and condemn the disobedient. Those who choose to disobey will surely receive sentence according to their works. So the ark of the testimony was to act as uh, uh, the litmus uh, for, for judgment. It is uh, the measure. It determines the measure of the judgment. Um, and we are told in... Uh, this is uh, HMR, page 100, paragraph 3. And he, Christ, gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communicating with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written by the finger of God. Nothing written on those tables could be blotted out. The precious record of the law was placed in the Ark of the Testament and still there, safely hidden from the human family. But in God's appointed time, he will bring forth these tables of stone to be a testimony to all the world against the disregard of his commandments and against the idolatrous worship of counterfeit Sabbath. There are abundant evidences of the immutable go immutability of, the, of God's law. It was written with the finger of God, never to be obliterated, never to be destroyed. The tables of stone are hidden by God to be produced in the great judgment day, just as he wrote them. 11, 1 BC 1109.3. When the judgment shall sit and books shall be opened and every man shall be judged according to the things written in the books, then the tables of stone hidden by God until that day will be, will be presented before the world as the standard of righteousness. Then men and women will see that the prerequisite of their salvation is obedient to the perfect law of God. None will find excuse of sin. By the righteous principle of that law, men will receive their sentence of life or of death. 1 BC 1109.4, also found in 1 SM 225.2, and the review and her January 28, 1909, paragraph 18. We notice should be made, a notice should be made here of uh, several points. Uh, in the last paragraph of the above quote, Sister White opens with the statement, when the judgment shall sit, every man shall be judged. The use of the word every clearly indicates the righteous as well as the wicked and indicates that probation has not yet closed at this time. To further show that the time of reference is not after the close of probation, she writes in the next line that then will then people will see that the prerequisite of the salvation is obedience to the perfect law of God. 
Her use of present and future tense of the verbs is and will indicate actions which occur during and after the tables of stone are brought forth. This indicates that people will still have an opportunity to make a decision to accept God's law, seeing they will be without excuse for sin. We can rightfully understand that uh, those who will see the prerequisite of their salvation will include only those who are alive upon the earth, seeing the dead cannot see. She doesn't say all men and women will see, which would be the case if this were referring to the time when the wicked are resurrected. Finally, in the last sentence, she writes that it is by the righteous principle of that law that men receive the sentence of life or death. Were probation closed, no one could receive life eternal anymore. It will be too late. Therefore, this clear refers to a time prior to the close of probation. This means that uh, the ark which has been hidden will be found just before the close of probation. And everyone will know that uh, uh, the Sabbath has not been done away with. It's still in the decalogue. And so in uh, Australian conference uh, review, we are told, that is point 3B, the light given me is that we are to study more than we do the instruction given to Moses by God after he proclaimed the law from Sinai. The Ten Commandments were spoken by God himself and were then written on tables of stone to be preserved till the judgment should take place. After the giving of the law, God gave Moses specification regarding the law. This specification are plain and explicit. No one need to make a mistake. Now, we are being told that everyone should study this for themselves about uh, what was given to Moses. I'll refer to the book of Malachi chapter 4. The book of Malachi chapter 4, speaking about the ark of uh, the testimony and the law of God. Listen to what the sure word of prophecy says in the book of uh, Malachi chapter 4, and I'll start from verse 4. The Bible says, remember ye, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Why? Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. Now, if Elijah is going to be sent, whom we understand is a people accentuated by the spirit of the Lord, then he is saying that uh, this Elijah uh, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. But remember the law of Moses. Why remember the law of Moses? Because even during the return of Elijah, we are told that the law has not been done away. Remember it. And this is in the time of the new covenant. You know, people always say that the law was nailed on the cross. Now, it will be illogical to say the law was nailed on the cross and then the Lord is saying, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I gave unto him at Mount Horeb. Why should you remember it in the New Testament just prior to the close of probation when it has done away, been done away with? It, it, it doesn't make sense at all. And then when you go to Revelation chapter 12, we are told that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which have the commandments of God, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So why say that the commandments were done away with? Why say that the ark of the testimony is not important? And yet just before Jesus Christ comes, the dragon is making war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I think the Pentecostal way of looking at the word of God, uh, uh, I may say, has not been the right way of looking at it. Remember, the Lord will send Elijah. And if you look at the work of Elijah, the work of Elijah was to restore people to the true worship of Jehovah and not uh, Baalim. 
the people had plunged themselves in the worship of foreign gods. And we read that uh, at that time, Israel had copied the other nations what they were doing, and they needed somebody to restore the true worship of Jehovah. Now, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them. And so the law must be remembered and the testimony must be remembered. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, we are told, seal up the testimony, uh, bind up the testimony, seal up my law or the law uh, in the head of my disciples. And so you cannot seal up in the heads of the disciples that which has been done away with. And uh, we are admonished, every one of us must study the law for himself and know the prerequisites of um, uh, the judgment and know what the Lord is uh, going, how the Lord is going to judge them. Uh, with his own finger, this is 19 MR 265.3, with his own finger, God wrote his commandments on the table and two tables of stone. These tables were not left in the keeping of men, but were placed in the ark. And in the great day when every case is decided, these tables inscribed with the commandments will be placed so that all the world will see and understand. The witness against them will be unanswerable. And upon those who have taken upon them the work of shepherds of the flock will be visited the heaviest judgment because they have presented to the people fables instead of the truth. Children will rise up and cast their parents, church members who have seen the light and been convicted, but who have trusted the salvation of their souls to the minister, will learn in the day of God that no other soul can pay the ransom for their transgression. A terrible cry will be raised, I am lost, eternally lost. Men will feel as though they could rend in pieces the ministers who have preached falsehood and condemned the truth. The pure truth for this time requires a reformation in the life, but they separate themselves from the love of the truth, and of them it can be said, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. The Lord sends a message to the people, set a trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Now, there's another point which I, talk, I tackle, but uh, I can just repeat in passing. When you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 8, the book of Hebrews chapter 8, in uh, verse 6 to verse 10, but now that is Christ, hath, hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of the better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, not the covenant, he saith, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. Verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 8 continues to say, For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their heart, and I'll be to them a God, and they'll be to me a people. So how was the old covenant? Uh, what, how, how was the old covenant made with the people? When you open Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13, you will find how the old covenant was made with the people. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 13. I'm reading from the Bible, the holy book, a love letter from God to his church. Hebrews, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 13, it says, And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. You start getting the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant does not mean sacrificial system. That is where people get lost. The old covenant had the law, but it was written on the table, on the two tables of stone. 
The new covenant in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 says that he will write the law in our hearts. So it is the placement of the law that makes the difference in the covenants and not anything else. It is where the law is placed that is different in these covenants that he's making with the people. Now, the children of Israel got used to seeing the law on the stones instead of accepting it to be written on their heads, on their hearts. And so they missed the significance of the Ark of the Covenant. The Lord wanted the law to be written in their hearts so that it may reflect his own character. But they missed the point and just continued looking on the law on the table of the stones. I hope that we shall not repeat uh, the same mistake. Um, the above quote, in our opinion, is speaking of the heavenly originals, which will be presented in the heavens and which are spoken about the next quote. So we have the law that will be seen. That one that was secreted will be uh, 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 disclosed and will be seen with the people before probation closes. Uh, but um, the second seeing of the Ark of the Test uh, of uh, the Ark of the Covenant will be after the probation closes. Originally, I warn you, originally, original law in the heavenly ark, I warn you, do not place your influence against God's commandment. The law is just as Jehovah wrote it in the temple of heaven. Man may tremble upon its copy here below, but the original is kept in the ark of God in heaven. And on the cover of this ark, right above that law, is the mercy seat. Jesus stands right there before the ark to mediate for man. This is uh, manuscript uh, 6A, 1886, and also found in 1 BC 1109.1. .1. The heavenly table seen prior to the sec Christ's second advent, but after probation closes. And so you can read that uh, in the Great Controversy, page 636 through 639, in order to clearly understand that uh, the time spoken of in in this following quote is referring to the time just prior to the return of Christ. Probation is closed already. So in uh, Great Controversy, page 639, we read, while these words of holy trust are sent to God, the clouds sweep back and the starry heavens are seen, unspeakably glorious in contrast with the black and angry firmament on either side. The glory of the celestial city streams from the gates ajar. Then there appears against the sky a hand holding two tables of stone folded together. So keep this in mind. The one that the elders of Jerusalem secreted will come out and be shown to the people before probation closes so that they may choose to either honor the commandments of God or disregard it. Then the second thing of the Ark of the Covenant will be after the probation closes to show the people that their decisions have been made and nothing can be turned back. We read on, uh, says the prophet, the heavens shall declare his righteousness for God is a judge himself. Psalms 50 verse 6. That holy law, God's righteousness, that amid thunder and flame was proclaimed from Sinai, as the guide of life is now revealed to men as the rule of judgment. The hand opens the table, tables and there are seen the precepts of the decalogue traced as with a pen of fire. The words are so plain that all can read them. Memory is aroused. The darkness of superstition and heresy is swept from every mind. And God's ten words, brief, comprehensive, and authoritative, are presented to the view of all the inhabitants of the earth. Great Controversy 639.1. What is the test of true religion? Knowing and doing the will of God. Christ, by the way, every now and then says, I have not come to do my will, but I have come to, send, to do the will of he who sent me. And if you don't believe, believe the works that I do, that it is God who is doing them. Um. So knowing and doing the will and doing the will of God in accordance with every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. There is a sanctuary, and in that sanctuary is the ark, and in the ark are the tables of stone on which are written the laws spoken from Sinai, 
amid scenes of awful grandeur. These tables of stone are in the heavens and they will be brought in forth in that day when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened and men shall be judged according to things written in the books. They will be judged by the law written by the finger of God and given to Moses to be deposited in the ark. A record is kept of the deeds of all men and according to his works will every, ma every man receive sentence whether they be good or whether uh, they be evil. Um, Finally, the heavenly tables of stone are written uh, are in Christ's hands at the coronation at the end of the millennium. Great controversy, page 668, paragraph four. As if entranced with the weak, the wicked have looked upon the coronation of the Son of God, they see in his hands the tables of the divine law, the statutes which they have despised and transgressed. They witness the outburst of wonder rapture and adoration from the saved. And as the wave of melody sweeps over the multitudes without the city, all with one voice exclaim, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, Revelation 15, three, and falling prostrate, they worship the Prince of life. So the ark again and the law is seen uh, after the millennium. The entire world, all who have ever lived, receive their sentence at the end of the millennium after the coronation of Christ. The righteous receive no sentence since their sins have been forgiven. Therefore, this next statement applies to the end of a thousand years. In uh, Prophets and Kings, page 187, paragraph 1, God will not break his covenant nor alter the thing that has gone out of his lips. His word will stand fast forever as unalterable as his throne. At the judgment, this covenant will be brought forth, plainly written with the finger of God, and the world will be arraigned before the bar of infinite justice to receive the sentence. And so let us look at other quotes about uh, the heavenly ark of the covenant as we enter into half of the presentation. The head by faith followed the high priest from the holy to the most holy and they saw him pleading with his blood before the ark of God. Within that sacred ark is the Father's law, the same that was spoken by God himself amidst the thunders of Sinai, and uh, written with his own finger on the tables of stone. Not one command has been annulled, not a jot or tittle has been changed. While God gave to Moses a copy of this his law, he preserved the great original in the sanctuary above. Tracing down it is holy precept, the seekers for truth found, in the very bosom of the decalogue, of the fourth commandment, and it was first proclaimed. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11, quoted in 4 SP 273.3. Sacrilegious minds and hearts have thought they were mighty enough to change the times and the laws of Jehovah. But safe in the archives of heaven, in the ark of God, are the original commandments written upon the two tables of stone. No potentate of earth has power to draw forth those tables from their sacred hiding place beneath the mercy seat. The fourth precept of the Decalogue remains unchanged, holding the same claims upon man as when the Ten Commandments were thundered amid, amid smoke and flame from the holy mount. That is uh, Science of the Time, February 28, 1878, paragraph 10. In uh, Science of the Time, November 14, 1895, paragraph 7, we read, But the original law of God is safely deposited in the ark in the heavenly sanctuary and will be presented to man just as God engraved it on the tables of stone. To the king on his throne and the humblest of his subjects, the law of righteousness will con constitute the standard of character and by it is precepts will be every work and by it is precept will every work be tried and every thought be brought into examination 
The fourth commandment will be found in the bosom of the Decalogue, just as it was written by the finger of God, and every soul who has presumed to exalt false Sabbath above the Sabbath, uh, which was sanctified and blessed and given to mankind for respect and observance, will be found out of harmony with the law of God. God gave the Sabbath to be a sign between him and his people, that they might know that it was the Lord who was their sanctifier. Those who have knowingly trampled upon the true Sabbath while they have exalted to its place a superior institution will have to answer for their action before the Lord who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is therein. God has proclaimed himself a jealous God. Now for a minute. If you go to Daniel chapter 7, you will find something interesting. The little horn trampling upon the sanctuary, what did he think to do? Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and, to, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of the time. The little horn, the man of sin, thinks that he can change the law of God. But uh, the Lord himself says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, that he has not come to do away with the law, but to magnify it. That uh, no title, until the earth and the heavens pass away, nothing shall be taken away from that law. Uh, the little horn also, the beast power, you find that it is clothed with the a uh, vesture, vesture of uh, the high priest, but um, it is missing the blue color on it is uh, 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 on it is garment that which symbolizes the law of God. And so, many religions and many churches have done away with the blue color on their dress to show that they have nothing to do with the law of God. But we are told that law stands forever and uh, it cannot be changed. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1, page 75, paragraph 4. In the autumn of 1846, we began to observe the Bible Sabbath and to teach and defend it. My attention was, was uh, first uh, called to the Sabbath while I was on a visit to New Bedford, Massachusetts, earlier in the same year. I there became acquainted with Elder Joseph Bates, who had early embraced the Advent faith and was an active laborer in the course. Elder Bates was keeping the Sabbath and urged its importance. I did not feel it is important and thought that Elder Bates erred in dwelling upon the fourth commandment more than upon the other nine. But the Lord gave me a view of the heavenly sanctuary. The temple of God was opened in heaven and I was shown the ark of God covered with the mercy seat. Two angels stood, one at each end of the ark, with their wings spread over the mercy seat, and their faces turned toward it. My accompanying angel informed me that this represented all the heavenly host looking with reverential awe or awe toward the holy law which had been written by the finger of God. Jesus raised the curve of the ark, and I beheld the tables of stone on which the Ten Commandments were written. I was amazed as I saw the fourth commandment in the very center of the 10 precepts with soft halo of light encircling it, said the angel. It is the only one of the 10 which defines the living God who created the heavens and the earth and all things that are therein. When the foundations of the earth were laid, then was laid the foundation of the Sabbath also. Um, in early writing, page 32, paragraph 3, in the holiest, I saw an ark, and on the top of side, it was pure as gold. On each end of the ark was a lovely cherub with its wings spread over it. Note the words in underline and bold. In the ark was the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of stone which folded together like a book. Jesus opened them, and I saw the Ten Commandments written on them with the finger of God. On one table were four, and on the other six. The four on the first table shone brighter than the other six, but the fourth, the Sabbath commandment, shone above them all. For the Sabbath was set apart to be kept in honor of God's holy name. The holy Sabbath looked glorious. A hall of glory was all around it. 
Why would God reveal the earthly tables of stone before probation closes? This is the question now we ask ourselves. In TM or Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 80, paragraph 2, the Lord has often made manifest in his providence that nothing less than revealed truth, the word of God, can reclaim man from sin or keep him from transgression. That word which reveals the guilt of sin has a power upon the human heart to make man right and keep him so. The Lord has said that his word is to be studied and obeyed. It is to be brought into the practical life that word is an inflexible as the character of God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, turn to the book of James. We are looking at why should the Lord reveal the testimony of the Ark of the Covenant or the tables of the stone before probation closes. In the book of James, uh, chapter 2, the book of James, chapter 2, uh, this is what the word of God says. Chapter 2, verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to person, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said not commit adultery said also do not kill. Now if, the, if thou commit no adultery yet, if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath shewed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. And so the reason why God has to bring forth the ark of uh, the testimony or his law is so that uh, uh, people may be able to be judged by the things that are in that law, that uh, people may be able to understand the judgment, how they are judged, because God cannot use the law to judge the people who have, don't understand anything about the law. He cannot use the law to judge people who don't understand anything about the law, and that is why he has to bring forth the tables of the stone before the close of probation. In uh, Desire of Ages, page uh, 808, paragraph 1, in his treatment of Thomas, Jesus gave a lesson for his followers. His example shows how we should treat those whose faith is weak and who make their doubts prominent. Jesus did not overwhelm Thomas with reproach, nor did he enter into controversy with him. He revealed himself to the doubting Thomas. He, he revealed himself to the doubting one. Uh, Thomas or Thomas had been most unreasonable in dictating the convictions of his faith, but Jesus, by his generous love and consideration, broke down all the barriers, and belief is seldom overcome by controversy. It is rather put upon self-defense and finds new supported excuse. But let Jesus in his love and mercy be revealed as the crucified Savior, and from many once unwilling lips will be heard the acknowledgement of uh, Thomas, my Lord and my God. And so uh, many people, when uh, the law is preached uh, accompanying the gospel, people say the law was taken away. The law is no more there. But then Jesus wants to remove every doubt that is in people. And uh, at the end, he will bring out the law so that uh, everyone may see and make a decision. Um, And so the word of God in his law is uh, binding upon every intelligent mind the truth for this time, the third angel's message is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, meaning with voice, meaning with increasing power as we approach the great final test 2 MR 18.2. The present truth for this time comprises the messages 
The third angel's message succeeding the first and second, the presentation of the message with all its with all with all it embraces is our work. Then uh, look at uh, 2MR 19.1. The third angel's message in its clear, definite terms is to be made the prominent warning. All that it comprehends is to be made intelligible to the reasoning minds today. And there is the reason why Christ is bringing out the law before probation closes so that everyone under the sounding of the third angel's message may make a decision either for God or not against, or, or, or not for God. So in uh, Prophets and Kings, page 186.3, we are told in the closing work of God in the earth, the standard of his law will again, will be again exalted. False religion may prevail, iniquity may abound. The love of many may wax cold. The cross of Calvary may be lost sight of and darkness like the pearl of death may spread over the world. The whole force of the popular current may be turned against the truth. Plot after plot may be formed to overthrow the people of God, but in the hour of greatest peril, the God of Elijah will raise up human instrumentalities to bear a message that will not be silenced. In the popular cities of the land and in the places where men have gone to the greatest length in speaking against the Most High, the voice of stern rebuke will be heard. Boldly will men of God's appointed denounce the union of the church with the world. Honestly, will they call upon men and women to turn from the observance of man-made institution to the observance of the true Sabbath. Fear God and give him glory. They will proclaim to every nation for the hour of his judgment is come. And judgment cannot happen. Judgment cannot happen without the law of God because it is the standard of judgment. And so they will proclaim fear God and give glory. Fear God and give glory to him. They will proclaim in, to every nation for the hour of judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark uh, in his forehead or in his uh, hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the darkness of his indignation. Revelation 14, 7 uh, to 10. Um, in... Uh, this morning to the church, volume 2, 692.1. There are in the scriptures some things which are hard to be understood and which, according to the language of Peter, the unlearned and unstable rest unto their own destruction. We may not in this life be able to explain the meaning of every passage of scripture, but there are no vital points, but there are no vital points of practical truth that will be clouded in mystery. When the time shall come in the providence of God for the world to be tested upon the truth for that time, minds will be exercised by the spirit to search the scripture, even with fasting and with prayer until link after link is searched out and united in the perfect chain. Every fact which immediately concerns the salvation of souls will be made so clear that none need to err or walk in darkness. Paragraph two says, as we have followed down the chain of prophecy, revealed truth for our time has been clearly seen and explained. We are accountable for the privileges that we enjoy and for the light that shine upon our pathway. Those who lived in past generations were accountable for the light which was permitted to shine upon them. Their minds were exercised in regard to different points of scripture which tested them, but they did not um, understand the truth which we do. They were not responsible for the light which they did not have. They had the Bible as we have, but the time for the unfolding of special truth in relation to the closing scenes of this earth history is during the last generations that uh, shall live upon the earth. Wondrous things are to shine forth from the lips of the messengers of God to go to the four corners of the world. We are the recipients of the grace of God. And as we behold the wondrous things in the law of God, we cannot do anything but be 
compelled to show these things to the world. John himself saw in a holy vision a class of people whose attention was arrested and who were looking with reverential awe at the ark which contained the law of God. And for what reason? That they may be catching every glimpse that comes from the throne room of heaven. How Christ made an offering for the divine law that was broken and it cannot be done away. If it could be done away with, then uh, there is no need of the sacrifice. If uh, there was any other means for a saving man, then Christ could have not died for man. But uh, the divine law required a divine sacrifice, and it cannot be done away with. So men may give every reason for not being obedient to the law of God, but uh, at the end of the time, they shall have found that uh, they have been uh, uh, um, uh, kicking at uh, uh, the pricks or kicking at the wall, and uh, they shall be found wanting when judgment shall be set and the books shall be opened. If the law was not important, then there could have not been a need for the high priest to sprinkle uh, upon the mercy seat blood seven times. If that law had no importance, if it is something that can be put away, then there were no need of the high priest sprinkling seven times the blood on the mercy seat. But we found that uh, on the day of atonement, the high priest entered into the most holy place and sprinkled the blood seven times. And then Christ, uh, the Lamb of God, entered the heaven itself with the blood which is better than the blood of gods and lambs. And why? Because the law was divine. It needed a divine life to be atoned for. He, Christ, reverend, uh, uh, reverently presents at the mercy seat his finished redemption for his people, exalting the law of God above all things. And so to bring this to a close, I'd like to read two things, and then uh, we can be able to close this presentation of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, we are told the activities on the Day of Atonement symbolize the people of God seeking representation by their high priest, Jesus Christ in the judgment, who met all the demands of the law perfectly and then was sacrificed for our sins. He paid the price for our disobedience, though he was perfectly obedient. The Hebrew sanctuary illustrates that ultimately all human humanity will be judged by the standard of God's law. Those with faith will keep the law perfectly through Jesus Christ. Those without faith will not have been able to keep the law of God and must die as a result. After all, the wages of sin is death. Since the law of God could not be changed, Jesus died for us in our place so to satisfy the law. By faith, we will take on the righteousness of Christ and be judged as keepers of the law with the right to the tree of life and eternal life. Just as all Israel sought representation by the high priest on that day, we should be fervently seeking our high priest, Jesus Christ, to represent us in the judgment. And then the very last thing, a parting encouragement, Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 to 15, the last slide. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, 
forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press forward the mark of the price of, he, of high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And so may the Lord continue speaking to us as we look in his royal law and his perfect law, as he continues revealing many things. We just look at it as the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments is a summary of the whole Bible and what God expects of us. I know that uh, in Christ, all things are possible, even though they look so difficult in human eyes. And so may the Lord bless us as we think about um, these things that uh, we are speaking about. And I know if uh, we are in him, everything is possible and uh, we shall be able to be presented before the Father in a perfect way if our life is hid in Christ. And may the Lord bless us. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you because Christ has accomplished that which humanity could not accomplish. And his victory is our victory. And so we have nothing to fear lest we forget our past history and the teaching of his word in our lives. And so, Father, give us thy own righteousness and let Christ dwell in us fully through his word. And whatsoever your word bids us to do, give us the strength to do it. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.